So in the interest of time, I'd like to get started. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Maxim Itkin. Um, unfortunately, we never got your CV, so I have a feeling, I, at least I never got it. So I, I'm, I know I'm not going to do, do you uh, adequate uh, um, due to your, uh, to, you, to your accomplishments. So I'll just say a few brief words. Um, he is the uh, associate professor of radiology and I guess pediatrics too, right? Uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where I guess uh, I did my fellowship, but many years before I saw these insightful uh, uh, things that are happening now. Um, and he was uh, educated in Moscow, so he's had a kind of international experience. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, did a residency at Rabin Medical Center. Uh, then did his fellowship uh, here back in the US, right? Uh, followed by staying on at University of Pennsylvania uh, as an attending, uh, and he's done groundbreaking work, uh, I think, in lymphatic disease. I'd say uh, currently he's probably the guru when it comes to lymphatic disease, lymphatic imaging, lymphatic interventions, really revolutionizing the field. Uh, if any, if, uh, just having heard some of his talks before, I think people are really in for a uh, mind-expanding experience when they hear what he says and uh, understanding really the importance uh, and role the lymphatics have in our body. Uh, and, uh, and the hidden role they had in many diseases that we'd never really realized before. Uh, so it's really a pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, Dr. Ikin, and I hope you uh, all really pay close attention to what he has to, to teach us. Uh, Jeff, thanks a lot. And um, as a piece of history, I actually, uh, my third or fourth case of thoracic duct embolization I did at Yale. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, with Mickey Talon. And Jeff, it was how many, 15 years ago? Uh, I was still a fellow at, uh, at HUB, but it was uh, one of the, this experience. So um, uh, the person that conceptualized the, the thought about potential of lymphatic interventions was actually Dr. Kopp, who is uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Kopp's mentor. He's, in, he's one of the genius of interventional radiology who um, you probably know uh, as inventor of a pigtail. Uh, or cope loop catheter, or that nephrostomy catheter, uh, micropuncture set, and many, many, many other devices. So when I started my fellowship uh, at the hub, he, uh, I asked him, Dr. Cope, I want to be like you. I want to invent stuff. So how do you do that? How do you come with ideas? And he said, uh, read all literature. It's all there. I said, no, it's like, Cope, you, you're not right. Uh, we are much smarter. And I completely disregard that. And uh, right now what I'm doing, actually, I'm uh, reading the uh, literature from starting from 1895, from Starling, uh, all through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And it's turned out that everything, uh, there's a lot of enormous, enormous amount of knowledge about the lymphatic system, and specifically about uh, the flow in the lymphatic system, not uh, immune, not lymph nodes, but how the uh, uh, lymph remove the fluid from the uh, soft tissue and deliver it back into the, uh, in, into the veins. And the way it works is that uh, uh, artery, um, the fluid from the artery migrate into soft tissue, picked up by the uh, veins, and then 10% of this fluid, and more importantly actually not fluid but proteins, uh, are taken by lymphatic system and delivered it back into the uh, venous circulation. Um, the genius behind the uh, concept of lymphatic system, of course, was Starling. Because before, before Starling, nobody had no idea how lymph is generated. And he uh, did a series of experiments where he realized that there is a certain forces out there, uh, uh, osmotic or, inter or, or interstitial fluid pressure, and we all know this uh, from a medical school, uh, the Starling equation. And since uh, his discovery, the people become absolutely fascinated with uh, lymphatic flow. So opposite to the arterial system or venous system, lymphatic is actually not uniform. It's multiple silos that connect it to, with each other, multiple lymphatic system. And three most important ones are liver lymphatic, intestinal lymphatic, and soft tissue. So liver actually generates uh, around 40% uh, of the flow in the thoracic duct that is the main uh, pathway for lymph to go through uh, and go back into veins. Intestine generates 40% uh, and uh, soft tissue only 20%. So 
So it's a staggering number. It's actually no, nobody knows right now. And this will, was very, very well known in the old literature. And that's how it works. All these fluids go all together to the cisterna cali, or it works in turn, in practice it's much more complicated, but it all goes together uh, into the thoracic duct, and then thoracic duct empties uh, all this fluid into the vein. So why, uh, in, in spite of knowing so much about lymphatic system in the 50s and 60s, uh, nothing came to the clinical practice? Because it's easy to... Uh, cut the animals, uh, measure the flow from different lymphatic ducts, but it's extraordinarily complex to bring it into the, uh, uh, translate it into the humans, because uh, lymphatic anatomy is extraordinarily complex. Imaging is lacking. Uh, the lymphatic vessels are very, very small, and they're difficult to introduce the contrast. So what we, we used to do, Peter lymphangiogram, and uh, Jeff will tell you how hate we it's a, it's a most uh, painful uh, uh, procedure in the IR, uh, and maybe lymphocytic decrease, and that's it. This is two uh, uh, studies we used to do. So fortunately, uh, we started to get a little bit into the, uh, develop some, recently developed some rudimentary uh, or, or initial uh, imaging of a lymphatic system. First, intranodal lymphangiogram, and then um, dynamic contrast enhanced lymphangiogram. And um, if we have imaging, we can intervene. And um, obviously, Dr. Cobb came with the idea of thoracic duct catheterization. And if you get inside the vessel, you could do different stuff. And then recently, uh, the interstitial lymphatic immunization been developed. And it's um, completely changed the, the way we practice right now the uh, lymphatic interventions. So after dealing for 16 years with the lymphatic system, um, uh, there's a two observation and, uh, and two main things I can uh, uh, say about that. So what's the most important, uh, what was the most important part of the uh, understanding, future understanding of lymphatic uh, diseases? First flow, different people generate different amount of lymphatic, lymphatic fluid, different amount of lymphatic flow, and it's for sure affects their uh, different disease processes. And number two uh, is uh, lymphatic variants. Um, we already discovered two lymphatic uh, anatomical variants that affect disease. It's a pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome and hepatotodinal lymphatic connections, but I'm sure there are more uh, to discover. So this is a uh, MR lymphangiogram we developed a few years ago. This is a normal person, right? You can see that uh, this lymphatic system collects all this fluid from the abdomen and takes through the, this beautiful thoracic duct and delivers it back into the uh, subclavian vein. But here is clearly something abnormal. On the left, and it is the same disease as patient with Kaposi form lymphangiomatosis, uh, the patient clearly has enormous amount of lymphatic flow because of the slow, because of the dilation and tortuosity of thoracic duct. But this patient doesn't have uh, any symptoms. From the other hand, on the right, the patient has the same disease, enormous amount of flow, but in addition to uh, uh, this flow, there's clearly some abnormal pattern of the flow that goes into the lungs. And of course, this patient has symptoms because this patient has anatomical variant that presented clinically because of this enormous amount of flow. And her clinical presentation, of course, shortness of breath. So why lymphatic anatomy is so complex? Because it's been developed uh, uh, from complex from multiple primordial buds that come out of venous circulation and fuse together. So if you can see here, the date of this diagram is 1915, right? So it's actually been done in 1915, 129 corpse, this Dr. Davis and Hopkins uh, dissected and figure out that actually it's complex. There's nine types of uh, thoracic duct and, all, and this is two most common. This is actually the one that I described in, in the books. Uh, and they account only for 40% of uh, his observation. So here's a, uh, two normals. On the right, this is a beautiful normal thoracic duct, right? That's how we're supposed to see that. On the, uh, uh, on the left, sorry. Uh, on the right, uh, the, there's a also normal. Why it's normal? Because it's 85-year-old lady that has always complex lymphatic vessels all her life. And the only reason why we know about that is because the <laughs> Some surgeon did surgery and cut one of these lymphatics and she's taking. But all this complexity 
uh, that didn't affect her life. So uh, I struggled with pillar infantigram for almost 10 years and uh, until we decided to start sticking the lymph nodes in the groin. And uh, that and that's came as an internal infantigram. We actually, when I look back, uh, it was described multiple times uh, before. We just didn't know about that when we uh, come with the idea. So we're not inventors, but the only thing we, we did differently, we used ultrasound in, instead of palpation. So it's very simple. You take ultrasound probe, uh, see the lymph node in the groin, and uh, put a needle inside the lymph node. And immediately you can uh, see this beautiful uh, lymphangiogram. That's how it looks on the, uh, on the patient. Um, the, the, uh, so the major obstacle to do lymphatic procedure uh, is eliminated because every interventionist can take a needle, ultrasound probe, and stick lymph node uh, under ultrasound guidance. The next big obstacle is a cons uh, 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 perception that uh, this procedure takes a long time and at the beginning of course uh, I spent uh, with scope nine hours doing each, uh, lymphatic embolization for with spittle infantigram so we're trying different ways to improve uh, uh, reduce the uh, procedure time and this is one of those uh, you can put these cuffs um, or, or uh, pressure cuffs um, or alternate sequen uh, ACDs alternate sequ um, compression devices and they can significantly improve the flow in shortened time of the uh, procedure. So after we inject Lapidol, we said, why should we inject uh, gadolinium as well? And uh, fortunately, during uh, three, four years ago, we had this uh, special system uh, at, at CHOP where you can connect uh, uh, x-ray table with MRI. So you put the needle, uh, lymph nodes, uh, needles into lymph nodes with ultrasound and x-ray guidance outside. Uh, MRI and then you slide patient inside the MRI and uh, it was immediately so, oh so this is actually uh, on the hub side we don't have a system so you can actually do uh, with a regular uh, ultrasound and to confirm a position you can inject ultrasound contrast and we right now did uh, 15 cases and it works Im amazingly well and then five cases out of 15 we have to reposition the needle so it's actually very very valuable uh, technique for somebody that does not have uh, this uh, system and, uh, and uh, on the hub side we do at least uh, four or five a week right now and it works amazing amazing well um, so this is another normal infantigram we have only a few of them we did maybe three or four hundred uh, by now uh, and here is something clearly abnormal you can see here there is a uh, narrowing of the upper part of the thoracic duct but then there is enormous flow goes from the thoracic duct to the lung parenchyma. This is a corresponding image uh, where uh, you can see that our catheter, we inject contrast, and this is the, the, the flow to the lungs. So what's wrong with this patient? Two things. First, she has a narrowing of the thoracic duct. Second, she's produced too much lymph because she was probably born out there. And we don't, uh, still don't understand uh, and don't have a, uh, any measurement devices to understand how much uh, people produce lymph. Uh, this technique, a angiogram, gives us an answer to this condition, whereas a non immune hydrops, why key has been born and they're swollen? Because we don't have thoracic duct, because all this flow goes into uh, 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 subcutaneous tissue, we call it congenital lymphatic dysplasia. So this is a list of different lymphatic interven interventions, starting with thoracic duct embolization, already 20 years we're doing that, Inter different types of interstitial lymphatic embolization, uh, and then we do thoracic duct stenting, lymphovenous anastomosis together with plastic surgeon and externalization of the thoracic duct. Konstantin Kopp was a uh, mentor that passed away uh, last year uh, at the age of 59. Again, he was an uh, amazing uh, person and uh, we love him and he's the father of his <coughs> all these lymphatic interventions for sure. Or, or. So, so he did his first animal experiments and designed this thoracic duct embolization as a uh, procedure, as a um, substitution for thoracic duct libation and calothorax. And that's how we do it. We do first infantigram. You can see the systemic highly here. Uh, we take 21, 22 gauge, gauge needle stick through the abdominal wall, uh, for, through the, for everything on the way, for the gut. Uh, and uh, put the wire and then a catheter is absolutely safe to do. Uh, we almost we did probably seven eight hundred procedures and we practically don't have a complication from the access uh, point. This is how it looks on the patient. It's a catheter, unsupported catheter. 
and that's uh, our injection. So after we put the catheter, we inject thoracic duct. Obviously, anatomy here is funny, but uh, uh, look, look what's going on here. Uh, it still drains into vein, but then there's a big branch coming up there down to the hilum and perfusing the bronchi in this patient with plastic bronchitis. Can we do something about that? Of course, we can embolize. We embolize it with coils and uh, glue. Um, this is a child with chylothorax. Uh, coils, very, very straightforward and easy. You just put the, uh, push the coil. Uh, importance of coil is a create a matrix for the glue to grab because otherwise it's very, very uh, uh, difficult for do, to glue polymerize. And then we inject glue. Glue is a radio pack. You can see it here because we mixed it with lapidol. It's a contrast that, um, uh, oily contrast that uh, delayed polymerization of the glue. So we can do this interstitial embolization, for example. This child has a very, very small uh, thoracic duct. So we actually can put a uh, needle into lymph node, uh, where is my pointer, a little bit down, and you can inject glue through this lymph node, uh, node all the way up in the thoracic duct, and that way you can embolize thoracic duct. Ability that we didn't have before. We might, in the past, we might uh, uh, gave up on embolization, and here we can absolutely do it. We use this technique all, all, all the time. And it's surprising that surprisingly, the glue does not polymerize immediately at the entry point, and, but it does not, and it works amazingly well. So when you have a new uh, imaging technique, you immediately can discover new stuff. And the first thing we discovered is it's something that we call pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome. That, did we discover that? Not really. It, when you read, read all literature, in the angiographic literature, people already talk about that and said, oh, it's a lymphatic reflux. What's different now? We can see it much better. Before that, we didn't have this dynamic image, so they just see some kind of contrast going in the lung and they say, we don't understand that. But we right now, because we have imaging, we understand it much better. So what is it? So you, the function, what's pulmonary lymphatic perfusion? The function of the thoracic duct is taking all this fluid from below the diaphragm and from the lungs and deliver it back into subclavian vein. In pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, uh, most of the time, the upper part of the thoracic duct or small or absent, and the flow from the thoracic duct goes inside, inside the lung parenchyma. And, and imagine yourself, all these liters of fluid perfuse right now the lung. On the left, you can see there's a list of different conditions that we already discovered, um, but there might be more. Uh, and there's some of them not on this list. For example, pulmonary aberrative proteinosis, we have two cases that clearly was uh, presented like that. So that's how it works. Uh, instead of going in thoracic duct, all this uh, lymph flowing inside the bronchial tree. Um, again, this is already normal. This is clearly something abnormal. All this flow goes inside the lung uh, parenchyma. Um, and the first condition we deal with is plastic bronchitis. Most of you, uh, unless you pediatric cardiologists, never heard about that. Uh, it's very common in uh, uh, children in Fontan, relatively common, five, uh, five to ten percent, um, and and it's turned out that's quite common in adults as well. We ha we do right now one or two a week uh, of this patient. So, um, what is that? It's a formation of a large cast of a lungs uh, in the bronchial tree, and where kids or adults are uh, uh, suffocating from them, and ha have constant cough. So. When we started doing our lymphangiogram, we immediately sh show, showed that in all of them, there's a perfusion of the bronchial tree uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, um, lapidol. And you can see this corresponding image when we inject contrast, you can see the uh, lymphatic duct goes around the bronchial uh, tree. Uh, this is another example with a branch coming from the thoracic duct that perfuses. And if you uh, inject blue dye in uh, the uh, uh, in thoracic duct while doing bronchoscopy, you can see immediately that this is a, a perfusion of the uh, submucosal perfusion, and in some cases, it's frank leak. Obviously, it's rare, this frank leak. It's a caloptesis, I would, I would call it, and it's life threatening condition, but it's absolutely uh, can happen, but most of the time, it's just perfusion. Um, so what can you do about that? The same thing we do with, uh, um, with thoracic duct composition for caloptesis, you just embolize that. So this is our study from uh, published in uh, Jack, a, first 18 patients with palliative bronchitis. The results were outstanding, uh, almost 94% uh, significant improvements. Uh, at job we right now do uh, at the rate of one or two week uh, kids, and 
uh, results are very, very good. Some of them coming back, and we discovered other pathways, but generally this is a mechanism, pathophysiological mechanism can be treated by, uh, by embolization. We have one uh, complication. Uh, uh, obviously, these kids have the right to left chance, so we have to be very careful about uh, anything spilling into the end. And you can change completely the life of these children, um, being on the TPA uh, inhalation uh, all their lives uh, since the uh, 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 vests, uh, steroids to the normal life. Um, we can do some sophisticated stuff, and sometimes they, uh, this abnormal, ab abnormal perfusion is not yeah, uh, very um, evident. For example, this kid, all we saw on the MRI just a little bit of kind of extravasation or abnormal perfusion in the mediastinum. Uh, when, you, uh, when we did uh, injection of the thoracic duct while occluding the entrance uh, of the thoracic duct, you can see it's actually some branches from the uh, thoracic duct perfusing this uh, tracheal bifurcation. So, and during that time, we've been worried about, uh, um, we've been worried about closing thoracic duct uh, in kids, and we still worry in kids with heart failure. So in this case, what we did, we, uh, we put the wire inside the so vein, snare it out, and put a sheaf, uh, uh, this is six French sheaf going through the arm into the thoracic duct, and then we, uh, uh, this is, we inject sheaf on this side. You can unfortunately barely can see here, but there's a perfusion in the lung, and eventually what we did, we de de delivered the stent inside, covered stand inside the thoracic duct to exclude the area. This is after we deliver stand, uh, we inject contest. This is stand delivery here. Uh, and uh, you can completely exclude. That was it stand stay patent? We don't know, but the symptoms of this patient disappeared. This condition exists in adults. This slide is not to read, it's just to show how much these people that plastic bronchitis can go through. And every patient that we have have a 10, 5, 5, 10, 50 years history of going through different doctors multiple different complicated diagnoses until they find the right uh, pulmonologist that knows, heard our talks, or knows about plastic bronchitis that are coming to us. We found in this patient exactly the same. This is abnormal lymphatic flow from the thoracic to, uh, to the lung. Uh, very, very interesting. All of them, uh, especially adults, we, on every adult we have a, a CT, um, has a ground glass opacification. Why? Because it's lymph is leaking in the, in the alveola. So for us, it's a, a usually the sign, if patient cough and cast and there's ground glass opacification, we know it's a plastic bronchitis. We just submitted the uh, article to radiology. When we inject, again, blue dye, you can see exactly the same thing in adults and the children. Uh, here's more typical part, uh, it's actually perf lymphatic perfusion, submucosal perfusion. And if you do a uh, bronchoscopy 20 minutes later from here, you can see this is how cast is generated. It's actually, if you see blue cast, it's whipping off the lymph through the uh, bronchial wall and, uh, uh, and then it's the, the cast dries out. So we will do uh, the same uh, embolization, this is adult. Um, and um, and again, this is where well, the whole concept of polymorphic perfusion is that it's uh, anatomical variant. Why? Because this is an 80 year old adult. He all his life is, is he lived with this abnormal with abnormal uh, abnormal lymphatic variant, uh, and they have no symptoms. And then there is something happened in, in his life. It can be trauma. It can be uh, heart failure. In the, uh, in the Fontan kids, of course, it's a heart failure because when patient has a congestive, especially right-sided congestive heart failure, they generate enormous amount of lymph in the liver. We're talking about from 800 cc for adult to up to seven, eight liters. Why we know about that? Because 56 is people measure that. They actually go surgery, cannulated as lymphatics measure. So something happened uh, in, in, in this life and this anatomical variant, uh, variant present clinically. Uh, for, uh, this is our first study uh, of adult plastic bronchitis. Um, seven patients uh, uh, we did. Right now we have much more, almost 40. Uh, they do an extraordinary well. Uh, well. It's uh, one of the most satisfying procedures from the outcome perspective. However, so what's the, uh, after doing this 20, around 20 patients, what we learned is that actually adult patients with plastic bronchitis, they're, they're, they're almost uniformly obese. Uh, besides only three patients that uh, in this uh, series we 
we we just uh, uh, submitted to uh, J, uh, JVIR. Um, so, but why obese patients have this plastic bronchitis? Maybe because uh, obese patients generate more lymph because there is no mass. You know, eventually this lymph goes into their uh, thoracic duct uh, and uh, the abnormal lymphatic overflow of the uh, lung parenchyma. But it's clearly statistically uh, significant. The same disease we see, uh, abnormal uh, pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, we see in neonates. Uh, this is a neonatal, isolated neonatal chylothorax. Uh, again, absence of the upper part of the thoracic duct and abnormal flow that goes from the thoracic duct to the lungs. Uh, this is one of the easiest and most satisfa satisfactory procedures you inject uh, one cc of lapidol, it's an oily contrast, that also embolization contrast, and you can completely uh, block all these lymphatics. This is not pulmonary artery, it's all lymphatic in the lung, and this gets two days later after this embolization uh, cured. We also, uh, it's complex uh, uh, algorithm of treatment of non-traumatic calatorx. Uh, it starts with most important uh, uh, I think it starts with scalacitis. That why? Because uh, most of the people, the most important uh, part of uh, um, evaluating and treatment of patients was non traumatic calatorx, making sure they don't have chylosacitis because there are holes in diaphragm. And if patients have chylosacitis, uh, the fluid from the abdomen can be. Uh, sucked by negative pressure into the chest. This, 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 is, right now. this is actually a video from the yep. OR. Yep. This is yep. diaphragm of the patient with chylosastitis. Yep. Okay. I presented the chylothorax, <laughs> and you can see here <laughs> there's holes in diaphragm that leak in chyle. So uh, what are the causes of non-traumatic chylothorax? Actually, only two. Uh, abnormal pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome and uh, ma lymphatic masses that extends from retroperitoneal into the mediastinum. <laughs> Uh, this is an example of the abnormal pulmonary lymphatic perfusion. You can see here, again, the same thing. It's the same disease. So it's just a matter where lymph goes. It can go bronchi, close to bronchi, it will be uh, plastic bronchitis. If it's go pleural fusion, it will be uh, go, go close to pleural, it will be pleural fusion, pericardium, it will be per, uh, pericardial fusion. So it's, it's the same disease presented in different ways under different uh, uh, conditions. And this is an example of retroperitoneal masses. This is non-traumatic calatorx, uh, a 22-year-old girl. This is the first study that said, eh, beautiful, thoracic duct is leaking here on mediastinum. She, she has a, a not, not calatorx, a uh, calopericardium. But then at the end of the study, we saw all these pathways. And I said, ah, it's okay. We don't know what it is because it was three, four years ago. We did, we just get first images of MRI. We didn't know how to interpret that. And we treated, she improved, but everything came back. And we did another MRI. We saw that the same pathway goes into her lungs again. And if we embolize that, uh, do interstitial embolization, put a needle and inject glue, uh, we can actually completely cure that. So we have a very, very good results recently with, uh, during the last four or five years, uh, with non-traumatic uh, uh, calatorx, pretty much 100% Success if it's not chylosacitis. If it's chylosacitis, obviously it's a, it's a different uh, story. The same with post neonatal car up on the post cardiac pediatric surgery. You would think post surgical chylothorax has to be traumatic, right? Because you know they go to the uh, chest and do something. But from the other hand, you think that actually the lymphatic system lives at the back on, on the back of the mediastinum, whereas uh, most of the time surgeons operate, cardiac surgeons operate in the upper uh, part of mediastinum, uh, uh, anterior part of mediastinum. And what we discovered is only two patients in our series 25 have actually traumatic. Uh, 14 patients have, this, again, the same pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, and unfortunately, uh, nine patients, uh, the SEDES group is central lymphatic flow disorder. So this is uh, pulmonary lymphatic perfusion, post-cardiac uh, uh, surgery, Enormous lymphatic flow go to the lungs, and somehow the this lymph is whipping into the uh, pleural space. Uh, uh, and um, in this series, in this series, we've been extraordinarily successful with specifically PLPS and uh, trauma. It's one hundred percent success. Whereas you, if you have a, a central lymphatic flow disorder, I don't have slides here. Uh, the outcome is. Uh, uh, pretty grim, and uh, we we think about different uh, uh, approaches to that. 
So the other condition we started to treat uh, recently is what's called pulmonary lymphangiomatosis. We're not supposed to use this term any longer. It's supposed to call uh, lymphatic anomaly syndromes. Uh, and this is a condition where kids and adults have a lymphatic uh, malformation all around their body. But what's most important is their uh, uh, um, morbidity, mortality, primarily depends on the full involvement in the lungs. So if you have a pulmonary uh, uh, involvement in the lungs, they actually die around 20 year old. So, uh, and again, you just saw this uh, uh, patient with Kaposi form lymphangiomatosis at the beginning. This is a girl, there's one of his diseases, there's a fourth of them, Gorham disease, Kaposi form lymphangiomatosis, uh, uh, conductive uh, malformation and uh, generous lymphatic anomaly. She has Kaposi form lymphangiomatosis. Uh, uh, we actually can embolize this duct and embolize this uh, lymphatic malformation uh, and hear what we're doing, uh, and they become better. Here's the MRI immediately after we embolize. Nothing goes to the lung, and clinically she's doing extraordinary well. So we have a very, very, uh, we're supported by uh, some societies. We did the study, first 10 patients, and we have very, very big hope they can prolong uh, lives of these uh, adults and children. So uh, I'm moving to the completely different uh, uh, lymphatic system, and it's liver lymphatic system. And uh, uh, here in this uh, institution, you have uh, one of the pioneers of liver lymphatic, uh, uh, liver lymphatics. Uh, uh, so we're hoping we'll co uh, uh, Dr. Vakiri. So we hope we we'll collaborate together. But liver lymphatic system again was discovered by Starling. Starling kind of found it and first said. You know what, people with congested liver, liver cirrhosis or heart failure generate enormous amount of lymph, and maybe that's what uh, the cause of ascites. <laughs> and um, its structure is super, super important. Uh, and you ask any hepatologist, none of the hepatologists will even know that uh, liver has a lymphatic system, but it generates 50 to 800 cc a day. <laughs> it's 40% um, of uh, total body proteins return to the blood circulation through the thoracic duct and through the liver. So how this does it work? How liver generates lymph? Um, portal vein, uh, hepatic artery, portal vein, mixed together, going through sinusoid into the central uh, uh, vein or hepatic vein. Then a lymph or interstitial fluid goes, filtrates through the wall of the sinusoid and trying to reach hepatocytes and then hepatocytes clean it and send bile that way. But there's a tiny space here that's called space of DSA, where the some of this uh, fluid retained and then transferred to the uh, what's called spa uh, space of mal. What space of mal? It's periportal space. So um, so when 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 you see uh, when when you do ultrasound or do CT on MRI and the report comes, oh, there's a periportal thickening, uh, uh, enhancement, uh, uh, so what is that? It's actually dilation of periportal lymphatic uh, vessels. So uh, there's a two, the lymphatic system of the liver is very, very complex. Uh, uh, there's a superficial, superficial <coughs> one, and deep one. Superficial uh, drains the subcapsular region, whereas a, where's a uh, central deep one goes alongside portal veins, alongside the hepatic veins. And that system actually carries 80% for lymphatic flow. Uh, as an interventionalist, we usually uh, see them when we do uh, biliary lymphatic procedures. You see kind of funny vessels go alongside the portal vein, and we ignore that So for, for years. So we decided not to ignore that. And this is our first case where we did liver lymphangiogram in a patient with liver lymphorrhea uh, post Whipple surgery. And you can see this enormous leak in the hilum of the uh, um, uh, liver. Uh, traumatic, obviously. So we inject embolize with lymphatic ducts and kid is doing much better. So when we, I started to work more with children for a few years ago, I faced this uh, uh, condition that's called protein using enteropathy. Again, this is a condition in children's with Fontan. What's Fontan? It's a severe right-sided heart failure because they have only uh, they have single ventricle. So um, in this condition where the kids, adults, uh, leaking um, lymph, uh, leaking proteins in their gut, and people knew that it's some kind of lymphatic, but 
because when you do endoscopy, you can see there is a lymph injectation, but truly nobody understood what's the mechanism behind that. So when we faced it, we said, okay, we know that liver generates enormous amount of albumin, uh, 12, 12 and a half gram, actually, not enormous, uh, a day. And, and concentration of the albumin is very, very high uh, in this fluid. So from the other hand, we know that a liver is congested in the skids and they generate enormous amount of uh, lymph. So maybe there is some connection between liver and duodenum. So let's do a liver lymphangiogram and if we see the leak, we can potentially embolize it. And here's one of our cases. We, this is a needle into a liver lymphatic system um, and we inject here contrast and you can see that there is actually leakage of the contrast into the duodenum. If we inject again blue dye, we can see uh, when, when our endoscope how this uh, fluid is leaking in uh, duodenum. Uh, and this is a glucose. Immediately after uh, uh, we see uh, the leakage, we can inject glue. And again, it's interstitial uh, embolization. We actually uh, inject uh, uh, glue into the network of a lymphatic vessel. And it actually can track surprisingly, although usually it's a super glue, truly. Uh, it can track all the way from this injection point all the way down to this uh, glue cast in Dordanon, and this is glue cast. So this is a schema, how it works. Um, you can see that the lymphatic is supposed to go to the uh, cistern cali, but instead some of them are uh, uh, going inside the Dordanon wall, and this is a uh, movie. So what is that? It's actually, again, the same thing, lymphatic variant. Uh, there's a some lymphatic vessel accidentally going very, very close to do it on a wall, and maybe 10% of the people sitting here have it, but it's never presented clinically. Why is it presented clinically in these children? Because their liver is congested, generated enormous amount of uh, lymph. In other <coughs> uh, um, evidence that support this, uh, this theory of lymphatic uh, uh, malformation, uh, lymphatic ano uh, anatomical variants and, and flow is that there's absolutely no correlation between severity of heart failure and presence of the protein-using uh, enteropathy or plastic bronchitis. As a matter of fact, all of our uh, patients that we treated and published inject to, uh, circulation and inject, they, they are um, normal fontans. Like, but even normal fontans, they're actually heart failure. The pressure, uh, fontan pressure, good fontan pressure will be 10. That is, in a, in a, in a normal person, uh, uh, right atrial pressure is supposed to uh, uh, right atrial pressure is supposed to be around five. So all of these kids have uh, or adults have a, a certain degree of uh, heart failure. So this is our study in Jack. Uh, we published um, uh, the last three patients. It's only uh, only eight patients. The last three patients respond very very well. They still it's very at least one year follow up and their albumin is doing very well. Why the first three patients didn't respond? They respond temporary respond and then came back because technique is developing. We understand right now that you need to deliver a contest somehow or embolization material somehow close to the wall of the uh, duodenum where they are leaking. So. Uh, This same idea is with uh, ascites. We didn't publish it yet, so it's kind of uh, um, just uh, came out of our uh, lab right now. So the original theory of ascites and CHF for liver cirrhosis was congestion uh, of the liver. Uh, and of course, liver generates an uh, enormous amount of lymph. So all this lymph, by the thinking of the people in the 50s, 60s, uh, result in ascites. So they did some experiment. They actually put a uh, bag around the liver and tried to collect the fluid during surgery. In the 50s, you can do that with liver service patients. And it, they actually did not uh, discover any uh, fluid coming from the surface of the liver. But from the other hand, they, they saw enormous amount of uh, uh, fluid whipping from mesenterium. And that's how they decided that the cause of ascites uh, in liver uh, cirrhosis is a uh, mesenterial dilation, aldosterone, uh, aldosterone uh, uh, um, the theory. Uh, so uh, this is, but this is a regional one from 50s and 60s, a scheme of the uh, pathophysiology of the ascites. So um, we already did uh, five patients with right-sided heart failure, one of them. Uh, that 
their heart was kind of a little bit uh, uh, sick. We have a little bit tricuspid valve insufficiency, but not uh, uh, sufficient enough. But uh, uh, they have an enormous amount of ascites. It's up to six liter a day. And this was their, their only symptom. And this is our first patient when we inject uh, uh, contrast. And you can see that first, lymphatic ducts is, are very, very dilated. But more importantly, uh, the flow, instead of going into the uh, cisterna cali, and you will see it here, cisterna cali, it's actually perfusing the mesenterium and then goes to the cisterna cali. And so this exactly uh, corresponds with surgical observation. Yes, it's still the lymph from the liver, but instead of going to the surface, it's actually perfused mesenterium and whipping the uh, lymph out of the uh, mesenteric vessels. So. Um, can we close it? Absolutely. We did it in a few patients, and it works extraordinarily well. The patient improved uh, significantly. Uh, this is another example. The same thing. You can see here this abnormal perfusion uh, into the uh, mesenteric vessels, and this is just a movie. And we are, the goal here is to fill as much as you can this mesenteric vessel, and we're still not uh, very good about that. Uh, so, but this is a patient didn't respond uh, uh, with ascites didn't respond to us uh, to the treatment because he di didn't have this perfusion. And actually, uh, when we look back, it's re we realize this is a patient just end stage of uh, heart failure and he's uh, edema everywhere and it's probably not good candidate. So, best candidates for this type of intervention are the ones that have isolated chylus, uh, not chylus, uh, ascites. And again, it's not chylus ascites; it's, uh, it's just a regular ascites. So, this is what we think right now. Uh, space of dif 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 liver ducts, uh, uh, liver lymphatic ducts dilated, then it goes into mesenteric uh, lymphatics, and then this mesenteric lymphatics are drained. What about uh, lymphocell? Can you treat uh, lymphocells in the groin? Absolutely. Um, this is a schema, so it's a common complication of different su surgeries. So, and sorry, I switched completely from liver to a different uh, anatomical area. So. Um, uh, this is a very, very complex uh, anatomy, of lymphatic anatomy, and uh, uh, surgeons or operators interfere here, they can cause leaks. So um, can you do something about that? Yeah, usually we do sclerotherapy with lymph cells, but sometimes you can do even sclerotherapy because uh, people are leaking from the access post-cuff procedure or post-ECMO, uh, post, uh, and there's no cavity to you to, do, uh, to treat. So the only treatment for that is plastic surgery to do a flap, transportation flap. So a uh, few years ago, uh, we decided to start injecting, uh, doing infantigram. Maybe you can find something. And immediately we found uh, that there's a multiple leaks in, in, in their uh, cavities. And they do exactly the same way. You just put a, a lymph, uh, uh, needle into lymph node and inject contrast. Um, and do again this interstitial embolization. This is our first case, and the leakage is coming from here. There's a small hole because of previous uh, cardiac cuff, and the moment you inject glue into lymph nodes, they track up, and it can uh, uh, seal the problem. So we have, we right now did approximately 20 patients. The results are very, very good. It's very simple, five minutes procedure, maybe 20 minutes procedure, uh, and uh, uh, can deliver good care to this patient. Uh, this is our glue injection. You can see you, the idea here is to embolize this uh, a vessel that leads to the leak. Uh, this is another example. It's a pelvic lymph cell. You can do, see that there is actually frank leakage into this pelvic lymph cell. Of the bubbles are lapidal, contrast what we use. And again, injection, immediate injection of the glue, filling all these vessels can uh, cure the kids. There's a few publications out there already. It's a known technique. Uh, and needs to be done uh, by everybody. This is uh, uh, recently, Korean become very active in this area and they published multiple, multiple uh, articles about that. Um, so, I have another maybe one minute to talk about future. Uh, future is bright. So, um, there's another technique we started to use recently, externalization of the thoracic duct. Uh, and we use it for potentially, right now we use it for pediatric for certain indications, but this is potential use of this technique. Uh, lung gut syndrome, thoracic duct fluid sampling, harvesting T-cell depletion therapy. So the idea of uh, draining thoracic duct is very, very old. There's a multiple, multiple attempts been done, and some of them very successful to treat all these different conditions with very good, uh, some of them with very, very good 
uh, success. What's the concept? Very simple. If you drain thoracic duct fluid, uh, you can remove all T cells and create significant immun uh, immunosuppression in this patient. Uh, and multiple sclerosis were treated. Organ failure, uh, acute pancreatitis, metastatic disease, leukemia, thousands of different things with uh, uh, very, very good results in some of them, but it's been completely forgotten. So we're trying to bring this concept back and saying the reason in some cases people were not successful because it was surgical technique and how surgical technique is done, you cut the skin in the area, pull some lymphatic duct and drain it out. But right now with imaging we understand very well that uh, uh, the anatomy is so complex, you just cannot just cut this, the uh, skin and drain thoracic duct. Yeah, on the left image, absolutely, but look at the right, complete confusion. Can we do something better? Absolutely, we can do it percutaneously with imaging. Uh, how we do that? Uh, we actually uh, uh, put a wire all the way into subclavian vein, open uh, access uh, brachial vein, open the snare, and eventually we can put the wire all the way in from the thoracic duct into brachial vein, snare the wire, uh, pull it, create some body flossing from the abdomen into the arm. As you can see here, that's what we're doing, uh, put, put in the wire, and then you can advance very, very easily shift through the, uh, uh, over this wire into the uh, systemic cali and capture the old fluid, not only partial fluid from the neck, uh, from one of the branches, but from the systemic alley, here we inject contrast uh, into through the sheath into the systemic alley. So um, right now we're using this technique to treat. Uh, 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 it's more for pediatric uh, uh, talk, but we treat this congenital lymphatic dysplasia. Uh, for example, this child was born high drop swollen. You can see all, all the old disarrangement of the lymphatic system, uh, and here we put a. Uh, this is how it looks like: complete disarrangement but we actually can access and put a shift uh, into the uh, systemic cali capture of this fluid. And you can see here from swollen ball, resuscitation a few times a day, uh, within 24 hours, a child become normal. Of course, the problem, when, why? Because we drain all the fluid. How much we drain? One and a half liter a day. What's the weight of the patient? Four liters, big problem. But, we have, but at least at this moment, we understand what's the pathophysiology of this condition, and, uh, but, and we're working on developing some surgical uh, ways to uh, uh, dump the always lymphatic fluid into the um, uh, soft tissue. Gut lung syndrome, another condition that we're working very, very close with uh, a New Zealand group. The idea here is uh, very simple. Acutely sick patient. Uh, uh, have a bacterial translocation from the wall of the intestine into the, from the intestinal lumen into the wall. Toxins generated, all these toxins go through lymphatic system and call, cause uh, multi-organ uh, failure. It's a so well uh, researched area. There's enormous amount of uh, 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 studies, almost 70 out there, showing that this is a mechanism. The only the problem people did not have a technique uh, this is a few uh, clinical trials. We have a technique, we have a hammer how to treat that. We also can treat uh, uh, lymphatic uh, uh, heart failure, congestive heart failure by decompression of the lymphatic system. We're working in a lab right now creating different pumps and, and, uh, and so on. Um, we, again, can very, very effectively do T cell depletion therapy and we're working with certain groups to try to look at that again. We can actually harvest uh, T cells for CAR T cell immunotherapy, which turned out every time we go into thoracic duct, we sample the fluid and send it to analysis. It's turned out that there is no T cell recirculation. All T cells in the thoracic duct, they are naive, coming directly from the thymus. There's no effect of T cells in the, in the uh, uh, lymphatic system. This paper right now in Immunity Journal uh, under review, hopefully it's uh, can accept it, but most, most the pra practical approach we can uh, harvest these T cells from the thoracic duct and give it to CAR T cell uh, uh, people to uh, uh, create the, the immunotherapy and uh, hopefully we'll start to do it pretty soon. Um, imaging is a key. We're working also trying to do dedicated liver lymphatic imaging, uh, interstitial lymphatic imaging, and uh, thank you very much. I'm a little bit over my time. <laughs>